Howdy and welcome to an intro series for the Bevy Game Engine. Bevy is a rapidly developing game engine written in the Rust programming language. The engine is entirely open source and written in the exact same style as the games we'll create in it. This creates a seamless experience where if you ever don't know how to do something, you can look right at the engine code for the gold standard. Bevy uses an entity component system programming pattern. If you're not familiar with ECS or have just heard of it and want to know more, this will be the perfect series for you. Bevy is the most ergonomic ECS interface I've ever seen, and I think it's the best way to learn the paradigm. And the skills you learn here will transfer to many modern tools like Unity Dots. There's also a rich ecosystem of community plugins that are maintained by brilliant people, which can give you tons of new features covering everything from XR support, to UI overhauls, to an editor experience, and much, much more. Bevy has tons of examples in the official repo which can show you any of the features you're interested in, and it's a great way for you to get a feel for what's possible with the engine. I've been using Bevy for two years now, and this is my third From Scratch intro series. My goal for this series is to cover all of the basic concepts you'll need to start making your own games in Bevy, by producing a real Game Jam-sized game and explaining all of the pieces that go into it. This is not a Rust tutorial series, but I'll try to stick to very simple Rust, so if you're new to the language and want a good first project, then you're in the right place. The game I want to make this time is a 2D farming roguelike game. I haven't made the game yet, and I'll be making it from scratch alongside you, but I think this will turn out pretty well and showcase all of Bevy's core features. Finally, if you have any questions, I have a Discord invite in the description, and if I'm ever away, the Bevy Discord is an extremely welcoming place, and I would highly recommend asking there for any problems you have, and getting involved with the broader community. This series is made possible by my wonderful supporters on Patreon, YouTube members, and GitHub sponsors. I really appreciate the support, and each one of them means the world to me. So without further ado, let's get started with Bevy. Today we're just going to get a very basic project set up and get a character moving around on screen. First, we need to create a Rust project using Cargo New. Any basic intro to Rust video or blog post should get you through installing Rust for your system. Personally, I use VS Code with the Groovebox hard theme because I know someone will ask. Now, in the Cargo Toml, we just need to add Bevy. This series is currently targeting Bevy 0.11, but the core concept should survive a few versions of Bevy with some minor changes. If Bevy is a much higher version for you, then check the GitHub link in the description. I will have either updated it, or someone probably has a pull request. You can also read through the Bevy news release for each new version to see what has changed. Bevy tends to have a few versions each year, so part of using the engine is making updates to keep up with its development. Also, each part of this series will happen on a separate GitHub branch, so check there for this part's code. I also have some other things I like to add to the Tomal for working with Bevy. First up, I like to use opt level 3 for package code. This tells Cargo to heavily optimize our dependencies. So at the cost of a longer first compile, the engine will be basically built at its release optimizations, which will get us a great speed up when debugging. I also like to use the dynamic linking feature, which gets us slightly faster compile times. This has some issues sometimes on Windows, so if you get exotic linker errors, then try removing this feature. And I'd also remove it when you're ready to ship your games. Finally, if you're on Linux, I recommend the Mold Linker, which greatly speeds up compile times for me. With all of this, I often get under 2 seconds from saving a file to the game running on my machine. Now in main.rs, we're ready to start using Bevy. First up, we add a use Bevy prelude star statement to the top of our module. This will import all of the core features of Bevy for us, and is something that I always use in my Bevy games for convenience. Now in the main function, we can create our Bevy app. The Bevy app is the core strut of Bevy and will handle running our game and calling all of our systems. Anything you want your game to do must be specified with the app strut. App follows a builder pattern, so after calling app new, we can add systems by chaining function calls onto it. To get us started, let's call add plugins and use the default plugins. I'll cover what plugins are in a future video when we create our own, but default plugins here just gives us all of the core things you'd expect from a game engine a window, input, asset loading, and much more. Then, after adding the plugins, we'll call run. Now if we run the app, we'll see a nice black screen which we can close and the program will exit. Now we need to add some actual functionality to our game. We do this by creating a system. In the ECS paradigm, systems are the actual code that runs for our games. Bevy makes it where systems are just plain Rust functions, but the parameters must be a restricted subset of types. For this system, we want the command strut mutably. 
Commands are how we interact with our game world. Commands lets us queue up things like spawning entities and are run periodically throughout the frame. We'll see exactly when and how commands run in the future, but for now just remember that they don't take effect instantly. The first thing we want to do with our commands is spawn a camera. Without a camera, nothing will be visible in our game, and we will always have a black screen. The spawn command takes a bundle of components to spawn a new entity. In ECS, entities are the actual game objects in our world. Entities are just a simple ID number and hold no data by themselves. The data in ECS is held by components. Bevy gives us a couple of bundles of common component groupings to make spawning them easier. Let's look at the camera 2D bundle now. Here, we see the bundle is made out of a camera, a render graph, a projection, a tracker for the visible entities, a frustrum, some transformations, a tag to mark this as a 2D camera, and some post-processing effects. Each one of these is a component and holds some data relating to how cameras work. This is very similar to how Unity displays all of the mono behaviors on a given game object if you need a comparison. So when we call command spawn with this bundle, we're telling Biffy to create one entity and associate one copy of each of these components to that entity. An important fundamental rule of ECS is that each entity can only have one copy of each component associated with it, and we'll look at ways of working within that restriction as we go on. Next, we need to tell Bevy to actually run this system. If we compile now, Rust will give us a dead code warning, which is a common mistake to see. If you don't tell the app about a system, it won't run, and this can be difficult to debug, so always check for this warning. To add a system, we just use the add system call before we call run. Add systems needs a schedule to run the system in and the systems to run. For this video, we're just going to use the two simplest schedules, startup and update which map on to Unity's default mono behavior functions if you have experience with that. We only want to spawn a camera once on startup, so that's what we use for our setup function. Now if we run the game, we see our black screen has become gray, which is the default clear color on the camera 2D component of the camera 2D bundle. If we want to change this, we can modify it on the bundle before we spawn the camera. Next, let's add a sprite to our game. In the same setup function, we're now going to spawn a sprite bundle. This bundle has a sprite, the transforms, visibility controllers, and a handle for the image to use. The sprite component also has some data on it that we'll want to change, specifically the custom size setting. If we don't change this, then the default sprite will be a one pixel white square, which isn't the best on an HD monitor. Now if we run the game, we'll see a nice white square. Now let's load an image to use as our character. I'm going to use this little 16 by 16 PNG character that I've created for this series. To use assets in Bevy, we need to put all of our files into a magical assets folder. You can configure this location, but the convention is just to use the folder named assets and Bevy will look there by default. Now in our system, we need to get another parameter, the asset server. In Bevy, one of the things we can get in our systems is resources, specified by the res type. Resources are different from component because they aren't attached to any given entity, and there can only be one of each type in our app. This is often useful for services like the asset server and other global game data structures. If you need mutable access to a resource, you can also get it with the resmute type. To use the asset server, we just need to call load with our file name. We don't specify the assets folder because Bevy already knows to look there. This will return back a handle to whatever type our asset is. Importantly, there's no way at compile time for Rust to know what the type of this asset will be, so you might get errors about giving it an explicit type. Usually, these are resolved when you use the handle, though. Asset loading is asynchronous, so it might take a few frames for your asset to be loaded into the game. Most things in Bevy handle this seamlessly, but for large things like models, you might see some pop-in if you have a camera looking at an asset when it loads. There are community plugins that can help you manage this, and will let you create a loading screen to wait until all assets are loaded before starting your game. For this series, though, we're just going to deal with the pop-in. Also, the handle here is just a cheap reference to the image data, so don't be afraid to clone it and pass it around. The actual image data is held elsewhere in the engine. Now, when we run the app, we see our character, but he's a bit blurry. This is because Bevy does smart filtering by default, which is the same as most other game engines. Because I'm targeting a pixel art style, I need to turn this off. We can do this by changing the default plugins, which also supports the builder pattern. Specifically, we want to change the default image plugin to use the default nearest version, which will use nearest filtering for our pixel art. We can also set the window plugin while we're here to change the title of the window in some other settings. You can look into the Bevy docs for the window strut to see all of the settings that you can change here. 
As a quick note, the Bevy docks are really great, and you should always have them open when working with Bevy. Most engine features are heavily documented, and there's always a push to improve the documentation. As a final task for today, let's get some basic character movement going. This is just going to be a first draft of the movement, and we'll improve this system as we learn more Bevy concepts. First, let's create a new system called Character Movement. Here, we want to get mutable access to the sprite entity we created and set up. We can do this with a query. Commands, queries, and res are the most common system parameters that you'll use in Bevy. Queries lets us get all of the component data for each entity that has all of the components we list. There are tons of details and advanced ways to use queries, but for now we just want to get mutable access to the character's transform, and we only want entities that have a sprite component. Notice that the query is generic over a tuple of references to our components. The parentheses and the ampersands are very important here. This will match every entity in our game that has both a transform and a sprite component, and it'll give us mutable access to the transform and read-only access to the sprite. If we didn't include sprite here, then we'd also match our camera entity, and when we move it, we would move both of them and we'd see no change. If this is a little confusing, don't worry. We will write dozens of queries over the next few videos, and you'll get super comfortable with them. For this system, we also want two other resources that the default plugins add for us. The keyboard input, which comes from the input of type key code, and the time resource. Now for the actual movement, we want to loop over all of the entities that match our query and get mutable access to the transform. Bevy's queries make heavy use of the Rust iterator abstractions, and if you're into functional programming, then I think you'll be very happy with some of the code you can write with queries. For now though, I'll just stick to simple loops for accessibility. Next, using the input resource, we can check if each key is pressed and change the transform's translation by a speed value multiplied by the time. In the next part, we'll create our own component to hold this speed, and we'll change the query to not get the needless sprite component. Now all we need to do is remember to add this to our app in the update schedule and every frame Bevy will run this system. Now when we use Cargo Run, we can move our character around on the screen. That was a lot to take in, but we learned a ton of the basic features of Bevy in this video. We learned how to set up a project, create an app, add systems to that app, spawn entities and customize their data, how to load assets, the basics of querying for entities and mutating their data each frame, and how to get user input. I hope you enjoyed this video and you're still excited to learn Bevy. Things will speed up as we learn more concepts, but I think it's important that we get a strong foundation for these first few videos. As always, thank you so much to my wonderful Patreons, and thank you for watching.